Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's such a, a pleasure to, to follow some absolutely brilliant talks. And um, as Andy mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk about this scheme I've been working on called the Sahara Forest Project, and particularly about the way that this demonstrates a biomimetic approach to design. Now, biomimicry is about looking to nature as a source of inspiration for, for new solutions. And to, to set the context for this, I, I want to uh, just describe something that happened recently in North Africa. In um, 60 BC, Julius Caesar decided this would be a, a pretty good region uh, to, to use to supply Rome with grain. At the time, um, it, was a, it was a wooded landscape, and uh, the Roman writer Pliny marveled at the abundance what a wonderful word, abundance. He, he marveled at the abundance of fruits in the forests and the variety of animals. So Caesar set about uh, chopping down uh, vast areas of this woodland. The timber was turned into ships or sent back to Rome to build uh, more, more parts of the city. Uh, the animals were captured and also exported to Rome, mainly for the purposes of killing Christians. Um, and um, just, just for the opening of the Colosseum, some 5,000 lions, elephants, panthers, and bears were transported to Rome. Say what you like about the Romans, but they knew how to throw a party. <laughs> um, and uh, for the next 300 years, um, North Africa supplied roughly a half, a half a million tons of grain to, to Rome. But over, over time, um, the, uh, the deforestation, desalinization, the overexploitation of the land started to take its toll. And in 250 AD, St. Cyprian, the, the uh, Bishop of Carthage, uh, remarked that uh, the world has grown old and does not remain in its form of vigor. It bears witness to its own decline. The rainfall is diminishing. Springs that once gushed forth liberally now barely produce a trickle of water. So what, what, we, what we saw there was an incredibly extractive model of, of agriculture and land use and really vast quantities of, of nutrients were extracted from North Africa and processed through the digestive system of the Roman Empire and then just flushed out into the Mediterranean. And when I said recent at the beginning, recently, um, I wasn't trying to be facetious. That, that was actually very recent. That's only 50 lifespans ago. And another way of conveying just how recent that is would be to um, it, it, just imagine the history of planet Earth uh, represented as a single calendar year. And imagine you're at midnight on New Year's Eve looking back over the year at what's happened. It's, it's been quite an eventful year. Uh, the first couple of months were a bit uncomfortable. Uh, March the 1st was when the first life forms appeared. No sex until September the 1st. December was largely ruled by the dinosaurs, but uh, after Christmas lunch, things uh, took a turn for the worse, and they disappeared. Fifteen minutes ago, Homo sapiens emerged. Fifteen seconds ago, Caesar colonized North Africa. One second ago, the Industrial Revolution began. And, you know, it, it seems to me that, you know, a, a lot of the problems that we have, and, and we have a few, but um, definitely one of the big problems is that this, this very extractive model has been continued and over the, the course of the 20th century really accelerated exponentially um, and add, added into that, uh, there was the, the vast release of, of millennia of, of carbon. Um, so really, that, that, you know, that was the, the 20th century paradigm. Um, and I, I believe that there's a new paradigm emerging. It's a, a paradigm based on, on biomimicry. And biomimicry, um, I think, has a, a huge amount to teach us, um, particularly about how we can make the shift from a from an extractive model to a restorative model. Now, biomimicry is really based on quite a simple premise. And the, the, the premise is that if you've got a source of ideas that has benefited from a 3.8 billion year R&D period, then it seems to make sense to, to make use of that. 3.8 billion years of R&D, beat that Unilever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, we're, we're, with that amazing R&D period, it, it, nature has come up with some pretty good products. Um, here's, here's one of them. Uh, this is the fire beetle, uh, which lays its eggs in freshly burnt uh, 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 timber. Uh, this beetle can detect a forest fire at 80 kilometers away. So that's a thousand times as sensitive as man-made fire detectors. And it doesn't need a continuous copper connection back to a power station burning loads of fossil fuel. Now, you might wonder, why the hell would an animal want to 
uh, fly towards a forest fire. Um, and there is a sort of popular science explanation for this, which is that um, when it gets there, uh, where the fire's just passed through, all its mates are there. It can have unlimited sex with no predators, and you don't get much better than that in the beetle world. <laughs> um, but it's, I think, you know, it's an example of an absolutely amazing um, um, uh, adaptation to a very, very specific niche. And, and here's another one that I, I quite like. This is the bombardier beetle. Um, and this has evolved a defense against predators, which it, um, involves firing out this jet of, of high temperature chemicals. It, it has a, um, a, a combustion chamber in its abdomen, and it mixes high explosives, hydrazine and hydrogen peroxide, from two chambers. The valves open and close 200 times a second. And that, that's um, uh, being used as a source of inspiration for um, needle-free medical injections, new, more efficient fire extinguishers, and better fuel injection systems. And I hope I won't offend any um, German friends in the audience when I, when I say this, but the, um, the Luftwaffe were, uh, uh, seemed to be aware of this beetle because uh, they developed a rocket interceptor called the Messerschmitt 163, which used exactly the same um, uh, uh, explosive compounds, hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide. And it seems like they were aware of the beetle because there was a sticker on the side of the plane with a picture of the beetle, and it, and it said, Wie ein Floh, aber a hole, which translates roughly as, like a beetle, but whoa. <laughs> um, however, they, they lacked the same sort of fuel mixing technology because a lot of those planes uh, just exploded on the ground. They, they weren't a great success. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe some of the basic principles of biomimicry before I go on uh, to talk about the Sahara Forest Project. I was very fortunate to work on the Eden project, and we turned to nature at pretty much every stage in this design process. We, we looked at soap bubbles, carbon molecules, pollen grains, uh, dragonfly wings, and that, that really fresh perspective of, of looking at natural forms as a source of inspiration was, I think, partly what enabled us to completely reinterpret what was quite an established building type <coughs> and come up with a scheme that was uh, in incredibly efficient. The, the weight of that superstructure is actually lighter than the weight of the air inside the building. So that's an example of using natural forms as a source of inspiration. There's, there's also natural processes and natural systems, I mean, all, all of which I think uh, offer very interesting sources of inspiration. And particularly with natural forms, wh what you find is that there's amazing efficiencies in, in natural structures like shells and skeletons, things that have been refined over millennia. Now, this is an example of a, a natural, uh, an evolved natural process. It's a termite mound. And um, as I'm sure you know, kings and queens can be um, pretty high maintenance. But arguably, there's no higher maintenance monarch than the queen termite, which has decided to live in, in a part of the world um, in which the temperature varies by about 40 degrees uh, between day and night. But uh, she demands uh, constant temperature in her egg laying chamber. Uh, with a no, no greater rise or fall than, than one degree centigrade. And that's, that's all achieved by passive means, using thermal mass, uh, natural ventilation, evaporative cooling, and so on. And uh, there have been quite a lot of architectural schemes based on, on similar ideas. So all achieved um, by passive, ingenious means. And then turning to natural systems, I, I think that this is a very rich uh, territory for, for, for solutions, for particularly rethinking the way that we run our, our human systems. And this is one of my favorite schemes. It's called the Cardboard to Caviar Project. And um, it was done by the uh, Green Business Network in Kirklees and Calderdale. In their area, they had quite a lot of posh restaurants. And generally speaking, this is the way that the restaurants were working. You had highly packaged food stuff coming in at one end, going through the restaurant, and then you're getting a lot of food, cardboard, and plastic waste at the other. So the food waste and plastic waste, they suggested that, uh, could just be separated for recycling. Uh, the clever bit is what they did with the cardboard waste, uh, because they, they were paid to collect that. They then shredded it and sold it to equestrian centers as horse bedding. When that was soiled, they were paid again to collect it. They put it into worm composting systems, which produced a lot of worms, which they fed to Siberian sturgeon, which produced caviar, which they sold back to the restaurant. Uh, which is quite nice because it's turned a very linear, wasteful system into a closed loop system. And that's exactly the way that natural systems work. Natural systems are all completely closed loop in terms of their use of resources and, and, and materials and so on. But what's also great about this is that it's, um, it's, it's, it's actually pr um, turned a very low value material into a, a high value material. It's like a sort of form of, of alchemy. 
Um, and if you're, if you're actually designing for a pretty challenging environment, then if you take a, a biomimetic approach, um, you, can, um, you can learn a huge amount by looking at the kind of plants and organisms that have evolved to live in this region. So this is the, the uh, thorny devil. Um, and this is a, a lizard that has evolved a way of actually absorbing water up through its feet. And it runs through capillary grooves up to its mouth. Uh, amazing adaptation to a, a really resource-constrained environment. And then camels. Um, camels are uh, pretty miraculous and I, I think deserve more respects than they get. Um, their body temperatures, uh, they can cope with body temperatures that would kill more or less any other mammal. Their nostrils are a miracle of um, water recovery engineering. So as the camel breathes in, it hydrates the water that's coming into its lungs. And then as it breathes out, it recaptures nearly all that moisture. And the small amount of water that it loses, it uses for evaporative cooling, so that its brain and eyeballs, which are essential for survival and uh, navigation, its brain and eyeballs can be as, as much as six degrees C cooler than, than its body. And um, here's um, an animal called the sand skink, uh, which is really more of a fish than a, a reptile. And um, when it needs to, if it needs to escape from predators or from um, the, the heat of the sun, it can literally swim down into the sand and um, somehow suffers no abrasion whatsoever. So a number of scientists are looking at this as a, as a way of developing um, abrasion-resistant coatings. There's something about the sort of sugar molecules on the skink's skin that, um, that does this. So just to, to summarize, we, we've um, seen there that um, natural forms uh, can be a, an amazing source of inspiration, um, as can natural uh, processes producing uh, very efficient ways of, of cooling buildings potentially. And there's a huge amount that we can learn from the efficiencies of natural, natural um, systems. So now um, we're going to go on to talk about the Sahara Forest Project. And just zooming out for a second, um, this, this is a, um, a little animation that I'll run in a second. It, it shows photosynthetic activity over the course of a, a number of years. And what you can really see is the, the sort of earth breathing in and, and breathing out. Um, and you can see that the deserts I increase and decrease. And just over this short time scale, if you look at um, Australia, if I just play that once more, you can see just in this seven year time period, Australia is really, really bleaching out. Um, it's suffering from a very serious drought. Now, the significant thing about this um, is that most scientists agree that if, if you look at the evolution of life on Earth, it was really the colonization of the land by plants that created the kind of benign climate that we currently enjoy. And the converse is also true. The more um, vegetation that we lose, the more that is um, likely to exacerbate climate change and lead to further desertification. So the question that we've been working on uh, on this Sahara Forest Project is whether it's possible to, to just intervene in that and just ch slightly change those, those, those conditions so that we can reverse that process of desertification. And um, the inspiration here comes from one of the absolute heroes of biomimicry. This is the Namibian fog basking beetle. And um, this creature has evolved a way of um, harvesting its own fresh water from the air in a desert environment. And the way that it does this is that at night it comes out of its hiding place and because it's got a, a matte black shell, um, it's able to radiate heat out to the night sky and become just slightly cooler than its surroundings. So when the moist breeze blows in off the sea, you get these little droplets of water forming on the beetle's shell. Then just before the sun comes up, it tips its shell up, the water runs down to its mouth, has a good drink, and then goes off and hides for the rest of the day. I think it's fair to say it's not a great quality of life, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a clever trick. And uh, the ingenuity, if you could call it that, goes even further. Because you can probably just make out there are little bumps on the beetle's shell. Now, those bumps are hydrophilic. They attract water. And between them, there's a waxy finish which repels water. So as the water droplets form, they tend to stay in very tight spherical form, which means they're much more mobile than they would be if it was just a film of water. So when, when it tips its shell up, it all runs very efficiently down to its mouth. Um, and I, I just think this, this creature is, is one of the best examples of biomimicry because it's, it's a, an adaptation to a really tough environment. And um, it was this creature that was in many ways the starting point for this project. We're working with a, a, an engineer called Bill Watts and an innovator called Charlie Payton. 
And Charlie Payton invented uh, this scheme called the seawater greenhouse. The seawater greenhouse is uh, a greenhouse designed for arid coastal regions. And the way that it works is that on the seaward side, you have this whole wall of evaporator grills. And you trickle seawater over that so that when the, um, when the uh, onshore breeze blows through it, it picks up a lot of moisture and is cooled in the process. And if we just look at a section through this, you can see what's going on. So you've got the evaporator at the front, the air blowing through it, it's cooled and humidified. The roof has a double layer of polymer, and the lower layer is opaque to infrared, which generally speaking, plants don't need. You also have a network of uh, black pipes in the roof, which provides further shading, and those th that has um, seawater running through it. So the combination of the shading, the infrared blocking, and the evaporative cooling means that it's 10 degrees centigrade cooler inside than outside. It's also very humid inside, so the plants need less water to grow because they, they transpire less. So creating a, a much better growing environment in a, a very arid region. The next thing is um, that the, the hot seawater from the pipes in the roof goes through a second evaporator. So as the air is uh, coming out of the greenhouse, it passes this hot evaporator, the temperature rises, it's able to take on a lot more moisture, and then it meets a series of condensers. And those are just thin-walled <coughs> polythene tubes with seawater that has come out of the bottom of the front evaporator. So that's cool seawater. And, and those condensers are just like a, a whole series of beetle shells. So it's a, 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 masses, a, a mass of, of cool surfaces. So when the hot, humid air passes those, you get droplets of water forming uh, which run down to the bottom where you can collect it. So this is turning seawater into fresh water just using the sun and the wind and a tiny amount of pumping energy. And the, the, the really uh, amazing thing about this scheme was that they found it was producing slightly more water than it needed for the plants inside. And they weren't too sure what to do with this because it was nowhere near a town, so they just decided to spread it on the land around. And this photo was taken after completion. Two years later, it looked like that. So it's been like a green ink blot spreading out from the building, turning barren land back into biologically productive land. And in that sense, I think it's fair to say it's going beyond sustainable design to achieve restorative design. So what we've been uh, keen to do is to, to try and um, scale this project up and, and uh, really explore some of these benefits and apply other biomimetic approaches to it. And particularly this, this idea of uh, restorative design and, and, and how it can actually make a, a positive impact on, on the ground around it. Um, so there have been three versions of the seawater greenhouse built. The, um, uh, and each, each one has been tested quite carefully, so we've got a very good idea about how they work. So we know that they evaporate about 50 tons of seawater per hectare per day. And if you were to think of building this on a really massive scale, this is Almeria in southern Spain, that's 20,000 hectares of greenhouses. That area is a, an agricultural disaster zone, really. It's all based on uh, extracting groundwater uh, from aquifers. Um, it uses, th that's all cheap polytunnels, by the way. So it's producing thousands and thousands of tons of plastic waste every year. Um, and it's gradually turning that land sterile because the groundwater is turning saline. But if, if that were all seawater greenhouses, that region would be a net producer of fresh water. So <coughs> 20,000 hectares of greenhouses, if they're evaporating 50 tons of seawater per day, that would be a million tons of seawater evaporated per day. Now clearly with, with volumes like that, ideally we wouldn't want to have to pump it. So what we've been doing is looking around for parts of the world that are on land but below sea level. And there are quite a few of these, some of them really quite deep. And if we could find one that allowed us to get a, a pipe to it, then in theory we can bring in unlimited quantities of seawater just under gravity. The other advantage of coming inland is that the air gets much drier. And just the difference in relative humidity between the coast and, say, 10 kilometers inland means that we could evaporate maybe twice or three times as much seawater and create much more fresh water as well. Another thing that we're keen to do is to look at every element of the system that is kind of underexploited and see if we can get more value of it, out of it. And the seawater greenhouse only condenses about a tenth of the water that it evaporates. So nine tenths just blows out, out the back. And there are some parts of the world where you get a, an onshore breeze that's, that's forced to rise by high terrain. 
and then it, it forms a mist or sometimes even clouds. And there's an amazing scheme that's being done by a guy called Schemenauer in Lanzarote. Now, quite large parts of Lanzarote were denuded of vegetation. And what he's been doing is putting up these fog nets because Lanzarote has this sea mist that blows in off the sea, but it stays a couple of meters off the ground because the ground gets hot, and so the mist uh, s stays a few meters off it. So he's putting up these fog nets, each of which funnels water down to a sapling. Um, and then when that sapling has grown up to about three or four meters, it'll start to harvest its own water. So this simple idea has the potential to, to revegetate uh, parts of, of Lanzarote. And for, for us, the, the, the ideal site um, would be one in, in uh, North Africa that actually has higher terrain downwind. So some of this mass of humidity that comes out of the back of the greenhouse can be forced to rise where we can capture it with fog nets and hopefully revegetate areas of desert there as well. Now, when we think about nature, we, we often think about it as being all about competition. But actually, if you look at mature ecosystems, you're, you're just as likely to find amazing examples of organisms that have evolved to hook up for mutual benefit, so symbiotic relationships. Um, so that's another really important principle of biomimicry, to see if you can find technologies that you can bring together for uh, synergistic benefit. So we looked around for other technologies that would work well with the seawater greenhouse. And the one that we settled on was concentrated solar power. And uh, the principle of this is that you use solar tracking mirrors to focus the sun's heat, to, to turn water to steam to drive a turbine. Um, and it turns out that this has some very interesting synergies with the seawater greenhouse. Not only do they both work extremely well in the same sort of parts of the world, hot, sunny deserts, um, but the seawater greenhouse produces demineralized fresh water. And concentrated solar power schemes need that kind of water to keep the mirrors clean and run the turbines. CSP also produces a lot of waste heat. We could make use of all that waste heat to evaporate more seawater and create more fresh water. So this summarizes some of those synergies. We, we also get uh, good dust suppression from the seawater greenhouses. And with, with the, the addition of concentrated solar power, we're pretty confident that we can increase the water production so that it, it's perhaps as, as much as five times um, the amount of a conventional uh, seawater greenhouse, together with the inland location. And of course, um, with um, concentrated solar power, you're, you're actually positioning this in parts of the world that are incredibly um, energy rich. So that, that square in the Sahara Desert, it is claimed uh, 263 kilometers by 263 kilometers. If that were all concentrated solar power plants, that would be enough to provide all the world's electricity. Now, I was skeptical about that, I must admit. So I did my own calculation. I looked up the surface area of the Earth, looked up an average figure for uh, solar radiation. If you multiply the two together, it turns out that we receive about 10,000 times as much energy every year from the sun as we use in energy from all forms. So that, that suggests that, that our, our energy problems are not intractable. It's more of a challenge to our ingenuity. So what we're proposing with the Sahara Forest Scheme is to really bring these two technologies together, to create a, a long hedge of greenhouses um, arranged facing the prevailing wind direction, and then have these uh, concentrated solar, solar power plants along the way. And um, this is how the, the scheme might look. So you can see all the main elements of the scheme. This, of course, is a very big uh, version. I'm going to show you a small one in a sec. You can see the sea in the top right connected by a sea pipe. Uh, you've got the seawater greenhouses growing crops inside, uh, growing uh, crops outside with some of the, the fresh water that we're creating. And then downwind, you can see some conveniently located higher terrain, forcing some of that mass of humidity to rise and um, form a mist. And of course, w with fresh water, if you're starting to produce significant amounts of fresh water, that makes all sorts of other things possible, not just uh, growing food in parts of the world that are very water stressed, but also for human consumption. Um, and in parts of the world that are really struggling with subsistence agriculture, this could be a great way to get them started um, on, on, on the road towards a more sustainable form of development. Now, some of you might be wondering what we're gonna do with all the salt, um, uh, which is potentially a, a waste product and if you've got waste, that's normally a sign that there's something missing from the system. So we've thought very carefully about what we could do with all this. 
And it's interesting that different things crystallize out at different stages. When you evaporate seawater, the first thing to crystallize out is calcium carbonate. And on the left there, that's, that's an image of one of the evaporator panels after it's been in use for a while, gradually getting encrusted with calcium carbonate. So we, we could um, just run it so that it builds up, and then when, when those evaporator panels are encrusted, you take them out and you put in fresh ones. And then you can actually build with that. It's a lightweight building product. The carbon in that would have come out of the sea, <coughs> sorry, out of the atmosphere, into the sea, and then into a building product. Um, there's, there's other things you can do um, with the next product, salt, sodium chloride, that's the next thing to come out. You can actually compress it and use building blocks um, uh, for, for building with. Um, our plan is uh, to try and satisfy Islington Man's demand for overpriced <laughs> and pompously packaged table salt. Um, some might say that demand is insatiable, but we're going to give it a good go. Um, and uh, the next thing uh, you get is magnesium chloride. That's a very valuable compound. You can use that um, as a, a desiccant in low energy cooling systems. And then I came across another use for magnesium chloride when I was researching peak phosphate. Uh, a lot of people were concerned that phosphates already run out, or oh, sorry, already peaked, um, which is, and phosphate is, is vital for agriculture. Um, and it turns out that if you add magnesium chloride to human liquid waste, it forms a, a valuable compound called struvite. Um, it takes nearly all the useful nitrates and phosphates out. So we think there's scope for another product there, overpriced and pompously packaged urine salts. <laughs> um, and uh, after that, you get pretty much every element of, of the periodic table. Um, so we're planning to um, use enlightened chemistry to try and extract some of those elements and use those to, to uh, refertilize the, the desert soil. Um, so this just summarizes um, how, that, how that works as a system. Um, and we're trying to extract as much uh, benefit from this as possible. Um, and I need to draw to a close now, really. So I'm, I'm just going to sort of summarize what, what this scheme does. Um, it's a, a model for how we could create zero carbon food um, l uh, masses of renewable energy um, and ab abundant fresh water in some of the most water-stressed parts of the planet. We're um, fundraising now to build a demonstration version. We just formed a partnership with a, a Norwegian NGO called Bellona. And um, the, if, if we were to, if we were to uh, look at biomimicry and think about how we could optimize every single element in that system, we could, we could turn to a whole range of, of examples to do that. Uh, we could use uh, the, the brilliance of the camel's nostrils to optimize the water recovery. We could use the sand skink to give us uh, abrasion resistance. We could even use the reflective coatings of this beetle to, to help us create um, mirrored finishes, potentially. And that, bear in mind that's all done with, with natural proteins and polymers. So in summary now, um, if, if you think back to that, that history of the Earth as represent represented as a single calendar year, if we're looking forward now, not back, looking forwards into the new year. The next quarter of a second is going to hold some pretty serious challenges. We could carry on with business as usual, and if we do that, we're going to be in for a pretty bumpy ride. Or we could decide to make some pretty radical changes. And if we do that, there are lots of solutions available. And I, I believe biomimicry has some fantastic potential in this regard. I, I, I think it has the potential to go beyond sustainable design to achieve restorative design. To, to propose ways in which we can shift from a carbon economy to a solar economy and to transition from aridity to abundance. Thank you for listening.